I feel like I need to admit something to you. I've dropped the ball on keeping track of how tall my kids are. Most people will draw little lines like on a door frame, but I haven't been able to do that because I've moved around a lot. So I decided that I'm going to build a growth chart. And since this is bite size engineering, it can't be just any growth chart. And this growth chart needs to automatically measure the height of my children. And I wanna record that information somewhere, you know, like in a spreadsheet. And this is for my kids, so it's gotta be fun. So then I got to thinking, do you know who else wants to watch my kids grow up? Their grandparents. So how can I share this experience with them? Well, look at that. This one's got a little camera on there. Let's see if I can make a digital growth chart that keeps track of my kids' height in a spreadsheet. It also needs to send a picture to their grandparents when they press a button. And since I tend to over-engineer everything, I've added some addressable LEDs and a thermal printer in there for good measure. So here's the plan. I've got some aluminum extrusion that will be the basis of this project. And then I've got a carriage that has some V-wheels on it, and those V-wheels will slide onto the aluminum extrusion and will move up and down. Now, in order to measure my kid's height, I need some way to read that information. So I've got a rotary encoder here. This will spit out pulses as it spins around. So I'm gonna mount the rotary encoder to that carriage, and then I'm gonna interface a GT timing belt with a GT pulley like this. So it's kind of like the extruder on a 3D printer. Instead of a stepper motor making the motor move back and forth, we're doing the opposite. We're gonna move the carriage by hand, and then we'll read that motion using a rotary encoder. I've also got a LiPo battery to power any electronics that I need, and I've got a microcontroller. This is an ESP32. It's a Wi-Fi microcontroller, but it also has a camera on there. And then I've got some perforated prototyping board here that I will use to build the prototype and then I've got these two items which are just for fun so I've got to figure out a way to mount this to the carriage so let's dive in all right so first I've got the GT timing belt this will ride here in this slot and then I need to slide the carriage on back and forth like this the encoder really needs to sit in between these two wheels here I like the position of this hole uh, I just need to drill it out a little bit bigger to fit the diameter of my encoder shaft So now I can slide this carriage on and actually thread the, the timing belt in there. Okay, hopefully this is starting to make a little sense on how this works. The timing belt wrapped around the encoder and spinning the encoder as the carriage moves up and down is what's gonna tell us how tall the person is that we're measuring. All right, so watch as I move the carriage back and forth, that encoder turns and will spit out pulses that a microcontroller can read. Now that I'm confident with the rotary encoder and the mechanical part of this design, I'm gonna focus my attention on the electronics. This is a prototyping board and I'm gonna solder the encoder onto this board and then I'm also gonna solder my microcontroller and everything. This board is what ties all the electronics together and lets the rotary encoder send pulses to the microcontroller. I'm over here at my computer and I've just finished writing some Arduino code that will go on the microcontroller. Right now, the only thing the code does is read the pulses coming from the encoder and prints it to the display. Over at the soldering bench, you saw me install a low pass filter using a resistor and a capacitor. A low pass filter like this is necessary to smooth out bouncing when you're working with electromechanical switches like this. In addition to the passive low pass filter here, I'm also debouncing in software using a rotary encoder library. So I'm gonna go ahead and spin the knob and see if the count goes up. Look at that, awesome. So that's just counting encoder pulses and if I turn it the other way, the count goes down back to zero. This seems to be working fine now, 
but it's really critical that it works perfectly once it's on the carriage because this is what's keeping track of the height. So if it loses a pulse here and there, it's gonna get off and it won't give me an accurate height measurement. All right, that end is clipped in. I just need to clip in this side of the belt. It won't work if the belt is slipping around. Okay, here is the moment of truth. I can plug in the battery and let's see what happens. You know what, I have the direction reversed. It's counting down instead of up. So I need to actually pull it all the way this way. And then zero it out here. And then as I move up, that counts up. <laughs> That's so cool. Now let's pull it back down. And you know what, it's a little bit off. It should end up back at zero. And I'm at like 52. That's not gonna work. That's really frustrating. Yeah, it has to like, it has to keep track of pulses, otherwise it won't give me an accurate measurement. I wonder if this is too fast for a rotary encoder. I know it's, it's interrupt driven, so it shouldn't be like a problem to count it that fast, but I know that mechanical switches like rotary encoders are really noisy, and even though you do your best with these low pass filters and the software debouncing and everything, sometimes it's just still too noisy and it doesn't give you reliable readings. Um, for my application, I really, it's critical that it's, that it's reliable and that it gives me 100% accuracy no matter how fast I move it up and down. <sighs> That's kind of disappointing. I'm gonna have to, to think about how to solve this. So I've been messing around with this for hours and hours, changing code, trying this, trying that, adjusting all these different little parameters trying to get this thing to give me accurate pulse counts as I move it up and down the aluminum extrusion, but I'm not having any luck. And I think it's just a case of maybe I just picked the wrong component to design this project around. I thought that rotary encoder would be a really small and easy way to accomplish what I'm trying to do, but it's clear to me that it's not right for this application. I think rotary encoders work great, for applications where you don't have to have a precise count, you know, if you're having like a volume knob or like a selection on a menu or something like that, it's okay if you miss a pulse here and there, uh, it's not that big of a deal. But in my application, I can't miss any pulses. I have to have it accurate 100% of the time. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to switch gears. I think I'm gonna have to ditch the rotary encoder and use something else. I was digging around my parts bins and I found this. This is a rotary encoder, but it's an optical rotary encoder. It doesn't have the detents like that one does. It's just a continuously spinning rotary encoder, but because it uses optics instead of a mechanical switch, I can get much cleaner signals out of this. So I think I'm gonna hook this up to the microcontroller and spin it to see if it works any better. All right, I'm excited to plug this thing in to see if this works any better than the rotary encoder. Okay, if we look closely here, I've got a simple program running that actually calculates the height. I took into account the pitch of the gear. It's a GT2 timing belt, which means it's two millimeters per tooth of the gear. And so as I spin this around, the height shows up there and I can spin it back and forth as fast as I want. And then if I go all the way back to the starting point, it lines up exactly. This is working so much better than that rotary encoder. And the cool thing about this one is that it has way more resolution than the rotary encoder did. So this is gonna work better, but there is a trade-off. I don't know how I'm gonna mount this to the carriage that slides back and forth. So. It's kind of back to the drawing board for that, but at least I've got this problem solved. I just need to jump in the computer and probably design a whole carriage mount that is specific to this rotary encoder. So let me go ahead and do that. The optical encoder is much bigger, and so I can't really use this. The most important thing about the plate that I design is the spacing of these V-wheels. So here's what I've come up with. I've got three mounting holes for the V-wheels, and then I've got mounting holes for the optical encoder. I'm gonna head over to the laser cutter and cut it out. 
This is something I do all the time when I am prototyping. If I need to check the layout or the spacing of a part that I'm designing, instead of spending 20 or 30 minutes 3D printing something, I'll spend 20 or 30 seconds laser cutting it just to make sure I have it all correct. It just finished and I'm ready to take the part out. Before I do, I just wanna tell you that I'm a huge fan of the X-Tool laser cutter. They're not sponsoring this video. They did send me this machine a long time ago, but I've already kind of fulfilled the obligation I had to them. But quite honestly, I am a big fan of this machine. It's a workhorse. I use it multiple times a week. And if you're in the market for a laser cutter, go check this one out. All right, I've got the hole here up top for the rotary encoder. And then these three holes are for the V wheels. All right, then the spacer goes on next. And the V wheel. Now that I got the V wheels on, I gotta put the encoder. Did I get the holes lined up? Perfect, that looks awesome. Let's see if I got the spacing correct. Perfect. That works awesome. Now I can continue this design. I've validated the spacing of my V-wheels and I can incorporate that into a 3D printed enclosure. The 3D printed enclosure will also have features for the battery as well as the microcontroller. The first thing I need to do in the 3D model is to make my base plate just a little bit bigger. It needs to accommodate a lithium battery as well as the microcontroller which has a display on it. So I'm going to create those features and I'm gonna create a little snap-in feature for the battery. I've done this in the past and it works really well. And then for the microcontroller, it has a display as well as some buttons so I need to make a cutout in the face plate so I can access those buttons and see the screen. Now that I'm happy with this design, I'm gonna send it over to the 3D printer and print it out. All right, here are the 3D printed pieces. They came out great. I've got a little slot here for the battery and the face plate has a little slot for the microcontroller. The one thing I did neglect and I didn't realize it until just now is a power button. I have a battery that's gonna plug directly into the microcontroller, but it will stay on all the time unless I manually unplug the battery, which is gonna be inside the case. And I don't wanna to have to deal with that. I don't think it's gonna be a huge problem to drill a hole in the side of the enclosure to fit this power button. Not bad. Okay, now I can start disassembling my little prototype here and putting all the parts onto my 3D printed case. That is looking awesome. The next step needs to be soldering the wires of the rotor encoder to the microcontroller. The last step was to 3D print some little nubs to go on the buttons. This just makes it much easier to push these buttons before they were a little bit recessed and hard to actuate. Now they work great. So now it's time to put it on the wall. If I turn on the growth chart, you'll see that it initializes to 500 millimeters. This is now at the bottom level. This is the lowest that I can measure. So when I mount it to the wall, I need to make sure that that's exactly 500 millimeters off the ground. In order to do that, I 3D printed some mounts for the top and the bottom that allow me to adjust up and down. Also, they don't interfere with the growth chart as it moves up and down. <laughs> you can see that one of the problems I'm dealing with here, one of the V-wheels on the back has an eccentric nut that I can adjust to adjust the friction and tension on this thing. So right now it's a little bit too loose and it's just falling down. So all I need to do is just tighten that a little bit and that'll fix the problem. But it's kind of annoying in the meantime. I need, th I need three hands, I'm telling you. Engineers need to have three hands. Get out of my way. There we go. That is much tighter and it's not gonna fall down as I'm trying to install it. This moves up and down so smoothly. The brackets get it off the wall so that it doesn't rub against anything. So now I just need to trim off the excess belt here at the top and at the bottom. So now I need to measure this to make sure it's actually 500 millimeters. So it needs to come up 
about 10 millimeters. Perfect. Now the bottom of the growth chart is exactly 500 millimeters off the ground. I can tighten it and now every time I turn it on, I can just zero it out here at the bottom and all my measurements will be accurate. Here's the moment of truth. I'm gonna pull out my license and it says here that I am five feet, nine inches. Let's see if I've been lying to myself. It's kind of hard to get this exactly. You know what I really need is something that sticks out, kind of like at the doctor's office, but that's easy to fix. Is it right? I mean, you can see it, but I can't. Okay, we'll see how close that is. I haven't looked at this yet. Five feet, 9.07 inches. That's amazing. How, how did I get it that close? This whole time I could have been rounding up. I'm five foot 10. I can't believe how well this works. I spent so much time trying to get that mechanical rotary switch to work. I should have been using this optical rotary encoder the whole time. But as I said at the beginning, there are a lot of bells and whistles I want to add to this project. It's really just bare bones. It needs RGB lights, it needs a thermal printer, and most importantly, it needs a camera so that grandma and grandpa can get a picture of my kids. All of that will be in part two of this video series, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it.